The Black Sea, as we know it, became what it is quite recently. About 8,000 years ago, the Black Sea was likely a freshwater lake, and its water level was much lower than it is now. Why did the Black Sea suddenly become a lake? This is a very interesting question. The fact is that during the Ice Age, and we are talking about the peak of the Ice Age, the ocean level significantly decreased. This is evidenced by drilling materials. We conducted research on drilling materials in the Black Sea, and from the core samples of the wells, we saw that there was land on the shelf at that time. Why did scientists decide that this was a freshwater lake? Measuring the salinity of water that existed 8,000 years ago is not straightforward. However, hydrobiologists have studied organic remains found under the ancient seabed of the Black Sea and discovered shells of freshwater mollusks there. This is indicated by the fauna of the corresponding age. It has helped us establish approximately when a freshwater body existed here. This is the fauna found in the sediment layers of that period. We collect it, identify it, and accordingly classify it into a specific ecological group. Knowing the conditions in which modern fauna of this type exist, we can infer what conditions were like at that time. For instance, there is a type of mollusk called Dracaena. This map shows where the shells of the freshwater mollusk Dracaena, which lives at shallow depths, are found on the modern shelf of the Black Sea. Since these mollusks live near the shore, it can be assumed that their distribution roughly outlines the shoreline of the freshwater lake that the Black Sea was until recently. Look closely. During that time, the Crimean Peninsula was not yet a peninsula. There was no Sea of Azov and the vast northwestern shelf, which now borders the modern coasts of Ukraine, Romania, and Bulgaria, was completely above water, forming dry land. Geologists support these observations with data that confirm the existence of this extensive freshwater lake. This primarily concerns the northwestern part of the Black Sea, where the waters are shallow. In this region, the Black Sea shelf is particularly interesting. If we were to conduct drilling there, or more accurately, collect sediment samples and reach down through the tubing to the Neo-Euxinian layers, dating back to the time when it was a freshwater body, we would find that the pore water is still fresh. This freshwater has been preserved there to this day. It turns out that in ancient times, fresh water from above seeped into cracks in the impermeable layers at the bottom of the sea. Then these cracks were sealed by clay and sediment deposits, and the fresh water remained trapped in them, signaling to modern scientists that the sea was once fresh water. But if this is the case, not only freshwater mollusks should have lived in the fresh water, but all the fauna would have been fresh water. That means there were river and lake organisms. In other words, the entire biology of the Black Sea 8,000 years ago was adapted to freshwater. So where did marine fish like sprat, mullet, and scorpion fish, marine jellyfish, and marine dolphins come from? We will solve this mystery a bit later, but for now, another amazing fact. It confirms that the level of the Black Sea was much lower quite recently. Ancient riverbeds of rivers that flowed into it are preserved on the bottom of the Black Sea. A paleo channel is nothing more than the continuation of the channels of modern rivers. They are clearly visible, for example, the paleo channels of the Dnieper and the Danube. These continue underwater below the current water's edge branching off in a way that corresponds to what we see on the shore today, only everything is submerged, and these channels are underwater channels, or paleo channels, which were actually riverbeds at some point. This is roughly how scientists reconstruct the ancient channels of the Don, Dnieper, Dniester, and Danube down to the current depth of 100 meters, which is the point where the shoreline was located 8,000 years ago. And here, it's impossible not to note that along the banks of large rivers, which provided fresh water and were abundant with fish, 
People in the late Paleolithic era loved to settle. This era of human development ended around the same time we are discussing, 8,000 years ago. This means that the areas of the northwestern Black Sea Shelf, which are now underwater, were almost certainly inhabited by our ancestors. Even 8,000 years ago, the Black Sea was a freshwater lake, and the shore of this lake was approximately 100 meters lower than the shore of the Black Sea we know today. This raises a pressing question. When and how did the Black Sea become the sea we know today? Chapter 2. The Black Sea, the place of the flood? This chapter is full of mysteries that are yet to be definitively resolved. Thus, as we explore competing viewpoints, let us not forget that all these are scientific hypotheses and each constructs its own model to best describe the observed facts. That is, after all, how all natural sciences progress. So, the first hypothesis relates to a catastrophic flood. Proponents of this view believe that approximately 7,500 years ago, the Black Sea was separated from the World Ocean and from the Marmara and Mediterranean Seas by the Bosporus Barrier. At that time, the water level in the Black Sea, which was then a freshwater lake, was much lower than in the World Ocean. A catastrophe then occurred, likely of a geological nature, perhaps something akin to a massive earthquake. The narrow Bosporus Isthmus was destroyed. In the area of what is now the city of Istanbul, the Bosporus Strait was formed, and a powerful surge of salty seawater poured into the Black Sea Basin like never before seen. Around 7,600 years ago, the level of the Mediterranean Sea was lower than it is now, and then an earthquake occurred. This earthquake broke through a part of the rock, causing a waterfall to collapse. Now, the force of the waterfall was approximately equivalent to 200 Niagara Falls. Water flowed through this waterfall at a volume of 50 cubic kilometers per day. This means that the water level rose by 15 centimeters daily. In the area that was the northwestern part, there was a taiga at the time with cedars and pines growing. Bears, lynxes, and wolverines also lived there. Mosquitoes, swamp, it was essentially a plain, and there the water advanced about 400 meters a day. And those people, well, people lived around Bulgaria. There were three settlements, and in the area of Turkey, there was a substantial settlement. Now it's at a depth of 95 meters. All of this was quickly flooded, and people fled from there, leaving all of these structures behind. It's a truly chilling scenario indeed. If everything indeed occurred in this manner, then for the people who inhabited the current northwestern shelf of the Black Sea, it would have been a true biblical flood. Or perhaps this event was the very prototype for the biblical tale of the flood. This mystery remains ahead of us. For now, let us examine the research facts that can confirm this catastrophe, the scale of which is difficult to overestimate. Imagine a waterfall with a volume of 50 cubic kilometers per day. For comparison, the Amazon River, the most voluminous river on Earth, discharges only about 20 cubic kilometers of water into the ocean each day. Thus, according to the proposed hypothesis, from the relatively narrow Marmara Sea, the equivalent of two and a half Amazons poured into the Black Sea Basin over the course of a year. How can this be confirmed? Some geologists find evidence supporting this scenario, but the time frames for this flooding are indicated more cautiously. But why do we know this? It's because when sediments near the Bosporus were lifted, many of these sediments were heavily brecciated. This means that they do not lie smoothly, but are heavily disrupted by the flow of water. We can see how this water flowed from this strait, and it was a catastrophic event. 
Indeed, there is debate over how quickly this happened. Estimates vary slightly. Some say it was indeed a catastrophic event that literally spanned just a few years, essentially within the memory of one generation. Others speak of a time frame stretching over thousands of years. Generally, it's challenging to resolve this issue because the accuracy of the methods we use is simply insufficient. Efficient. And along with this water came Mediterranean species, those that survived in this slightly desalinated water. These are the species that eventually populated the Black Sea. The most prominent proponents of the catastrophic Black Sea flood theory were the American researchers William Ryan and Walter Pittman from Columbia University. From their perspective, Here's how the Marmara and Black Seas looked before and during the flooding. Guided by data, most of which you are already familiar with, they published a book in the late 1990s with the sensational title, Noah's Flood, the new scientific discoveries about the event that changed history. Their enthusiasm was warmly supported by oceanographer Robert Ballard. He had already gained fame for one confirmed sensation by then. In 1985, he discovered the wreckage of the Titanic at the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean. Ballard investigated a hypothetical sunken settlement off the northern coast of Turkey using underwater robots. He found numerous artifacts indicating that people had lived on this seabed. However, there was no explicit confirmation that this occurred 7,500 years ago when the rise in water levels was catastrophically fast. Nevertheless, Ballard supported the flood theory in his publications. Since then, numerous submerged settlements have been discovered in the Black Sea Basin. For example, the ancient Greek port city of Acre, located at the southernmost point of the Kerch Strait. The Science TV channel produced a documentary about it titled Acre, the Crimean Atlantis. This city was abandoned by its inhabitants seemingly all of the sudden, with almost all domestic utensils left behind. However, all this cannot confirm the theory of the Crimean Flood, as Acre was inhabited from the 6th century BCE to the 4th century CE. It appears that it went underwater as a result of local tectonic processes rather than a catastrophic wide-scale flooding event. The second hypothesis suggests a gradual flooding First, it's important to remember that about 12,000 years ago, the last great ice age came to an end. During the glacial period, huge masses of water were concentrated on land as ice, which naturally meant that the overall level of the world ocean was significantly lower. Research materials from the Marmara Sea indicate that during the last ice age, the Marmara Sea was also a lake. This implies that there was no connection between the Marmara and the Mediterranean Sea. Consequently, there would have been no connection between the Marmara and the Black Sea either. But as the glaciers began to melt, their waters started filling all available bodies of water. Naturally, the bodies of water with the largest drainage basins began to fill up the fastest. Among all the major bodies of water near the Black Sea, the Caspian Sea has the largest basin, even now covering over 3 million square kilometers. At the end of the last ice age, it was even more extensive. Since the Caspian Sea is a lake, its water balance and level depend on the components of the water balance. As the last ice age began to degrade, it meant the melting of the ice cap and a permafrost, which was located over a vast area on the Eastern European Plain. With the degradation of the last glaciation, Caspian Sea significantly raised its level. Its level rose to plus 45 meters, whereas now the level is minus 28. When the Caspian Sea reached the threshold of the Manic Spillway, it began to discharge its waters into the Black Sea. 
This formed the so-called Quilinian Strait, which connected the Caspian Sea with the Black Sea. The Caspian Sea dumped its excess water into the Black Sea Basin. However, the level of the Black Sea could not rise sufficiently high because the Bosporus threshold is low. Because the Bosporus Strait existed, no matter how much the Black Sea raised its level, the waters were discharged into the Marmara Sea and then into the Mediterranean Sea. Geological evidence of such a discharge exists. In the Marmara Sea, we find sediments with mollusks and microfauna that lived at the time in the Black Sea. It might boggle the mind of any rational person. The first hypothesis involves a catastrophic influx of salty water from the Marmara Sea into the Black Sea. The second hypothesis suggests the filling of both the Black and Marmara Seas with fresh water from the Caspian Basin. Both hypotheses have experimental arguments supporting them, but such is the nature of science. The hypothesis of the Black Sea flood proposed by Bill Ryan, here's his book he gave me. It has his inscription. It's based on research materials from ship expeditions by the Institute of Oceanology. It suggests the discovery of a flood that supposedly occurred 8,000 years ago in the Black Sea, which was later not fully confirmed. Subsequent findings indicated slight errors in the timing and location of this flood. It turned out that the epicenter of the flood was not the Black Sea, though it was involved, but rather the Caspian Sea. This led to the publication of another book, The Problem of the Black Sea Flood, also published in New York with many authors contributing and arguments against this hypothesis. These pros and cons will likely be debated in geographical science for a long time. It is possible that the two conflicting hypotheses will someday be merged into a third one, as they both originate from one fact recognized by everyone. At the end of the last ice age, the Black Sea was a freshwater lake with a much lower water level than it is today. Well, there were certainly two events, the rise in the level of the world ocean and some kind of tectonic event. Now, we must choose. If we're talking about a catastrophic event, then it's undoubtedly tectonic. If it's about the gradual salinization of the Black Sea, then it's more likely the rise in the level of the world ocean. But the Caspian hypothesis does not yet explain this. Why did the Black Sea become salty if it was already a freshwater lake, and then a huge amount of fresh water flowed into it from the Caspian, so much that it overflowed through the Bosporus into the Marmara Sea? However, water exchange through the Bosporus is still a complex process even today. Fortunately, scientists can observe it firsthand. These observations show that in the upper part of the Bosporus, the less salty Black Sea water moves towards the salty Mediterranean Sea, while at the bottom, a reverse process occurs. The denser, salty water from the shallow Marmara Sea essentially flows into the deep Black Sea Basin. Two currents, one flowing out and one flowing in. However, the flow from the Black Sea is evidently larger because a number of rivers discharge into the Black Sea, bringing in more water than what evaporates from its surface. Yet the water flowing in is fresh, while the water flowing out is salty. This indicates that the water gets entrained, mixes slightly, and drags along some of the salty water with it. Since the salty water is denser, it must replace the water that is carried out through this strait. Chapter 3, The Black Sea Legacy. Where did the people go? No matter the speed or direction from which the Black Sea was filled with water at the end of the last ice age, one thing is clear. The vast habitable spaces along the ancient riverbeds of the Don, Dnieper, Dniester, and Danube were surely inhabited by humans. After all, the Black Sea region is one of the oldest areas of human expansion including both of its largest known branches, Homo sapiens 
and the earlier Neanderthals. There are numerous sites in the Northern Black Sea region that date back to the Middle Paleolithic, Upper Paleolithic, and the Late Paleolithic periods. This means that the area was settled by the ancestors, or rather, predecessors of both the Neanderthals and Homo sapiens. It is widely accepted that early Paleolithic humans were also present in the region. Whether these were Heidelberg humans or some other forms, we can't say with absolute certainty at the moment, but there is no doubt that this region was inhabited. The transition between the Upper Paleolithic or Mesolithic and the early Neolithic coincides with the end of the last glacial period. This was slightly before the hypothetical Black Sea flood occurred. However, archaeologists are certain the glacier did not reach the Black Sea coast, and ancient humans found it comfortable to live both along the shores and along the riverbeds on what is now the submerged shelf. The beginning of the Holocene, a period very complex because, as you understand, this time was not characterized by not uniform, but rather fluctuating, glacial melting. And many territories ended up being sort of, well, rendered uninhabitable. However, in the northern Black Sea coast, especially in areas that are not lowlands, but rather with some elevations, populations either continued to exist or re-emerged. This is exemplified by one of the very famous Mesolithic burial sites, the Murzak Koba monument, where, where a paired burial of a man and a woman was discovered. And the woman, a very young woman, showed very interesting traces of what was most likely ritual activity, because her phalanges of the little fingers had been amputated and there was symbolic trepanation on her skull. Thus, the appearance of these people, with pronounced europoid features, that is, profiled faces, protruding nasal bones, was connected specifically with the local European population that settled there earlier. Before the flooding of the Black Sea's shelf zones, these lands must have been highly conducive to the development of civilization. Some experts compare the conditions there to those of the Nile Valley or Mesopotamia. Numerous rivers overflowed during seasonal floods, leaving behind perfectly fertilized soil. This could have stimulated the emergence of agriculture, settled lifestyles, and the development of crafts. Understandably, a sea level rise of more than 100 meters, regardless of the speed at which it occurred, was a catastrophic event for the shelf inhabitants. Those who survived had to urgently evacuate, moving hundreds of kilometers to the northwest. Balkan archaeologists link the emergency evacuation of Black Sea tribes from the flood to the emergence of highly developed Neolithic cultures in the northwest Black Sea region, the Varna culture in Bulgaria, the Hamangia culture in Romania, and even the mysterious Vincia culture in Serbia. Can an objective connection be established between the Neolithic inhabitants of the Western Black Sea region and the peoples fleeing from the bottom of the Black Sea? There was even a project that was both scientific and popular in nature. Funds for deep sea diving were secured, and indeed, traces of human presence were discovered in this shelf zone. This was not surprising. It is clear that people had to have moved from there. And the lands, all the coastlines, it should be noted that particularly for the Neolithic period, the shores of freshwater bodies were favored places for human settlements. Therefore, logically, the Western Black Sea region suffered the most because it primarily consists of these low-lying, flat areas. Consequently, huge territories went underwater. As we can see on the map, this is accessible. To say that during this time in Southern or Eastern Europe, we observed some sort of migratory wave, 
Well, I personally cannot, based on paleoanthropological data. And I think that making any judgments about this is quite premature, because we have not yet had the opportunity to construct a well-argued system of evidence, and we do not have the materials that come from beneath the thickness of this water. Underwater archaeologists are engaged with artifacts that come from beneath the thickness of the water. They are extremely active in the Black Sea because its seabed is like a giant repository where each era, each civilization, and each people have dropped something. All these artifacts remain at the bottom, and reaching them is quite challenging. In the primary, the main material that we encounter naturally is archaeological, and this primarily consists of pottery, which is most resistant to the aggressive effects of the external environment. However, as we see, there are objects that we cannot lift. These are entire architectural structures. We have not yet processed all the archaeological material, but, for instance, the 8th and 9th centuries are definitely present. We've also found coins, and more this season, we discovered two more coins from a later period. Underwater archaeologists find what the sea presents to them, primarily artifacts from late antiquity and the Middle Ages. And, of course, no one today has a systematic, scientifically developed plan to explore the pre-flood shores and river valleys hidden under a hundred meters of water. One hypothesis, indeed, concerns the catastrophic process of the flood, but it could also have been a process that extended over a significant period of time. Yes, that is, we cannot definitively assert anything as of now. However, during our archaeological, our underwater research, we occasionally find individual items, primarily stone tools from the pre-Greek period. These studies must be interdisciplinary because they require the involvement of oceanographers, paleobotanists, and archaeologists. Indeed, this is both a feasible and necessary endeavor. It's clear that the cost of such research is comparable to the price of a nuclear power station. Most likely, it should be conducted by some sort of international consortium. At a depth of 100 meters, everything is covered with sediment deposits, everything smoothed over. Digging a random trench there and retrieving a shard of the Mesolithic pot is less likely than blindly pulling a needle from a haystack. Chapter 4. The Black Sea. Arena of the Global Flood? Everything appears extremely logical. The Black Sea Basin neighbors the oldest foci of civilizations, Anatolia, the Near East, the Mediterranean Islands, and Greece, Mesopotamia, and Egypt is not too far away either. The news of the rapid flooding of the inhabited Black Sea Basin could not have failed to spread throughout the known world, even over a few hundred years, which would be like a telegram speed for the Neolithic era. And consider how similar the resulting myths are. The biblical story of the flood is well known. It's notable that Mount Ararat, to which, according to tradition, Noah's Ark came to rest, is located not far from the Black Sea. There's a similar story in Greek mythology. For instance, the flood of Deucalion, when Deucalion and his wife Pyrrha sailed in a chest for nine days and nights over the flooded earth and landed on Parnassus. The Sumerian legend of the flood is almost indistinguishable from the biblical one. King Ziasudra built a huge ship to save his family and all the animals. After six days of sailing, he moored at the peak of Nisir, as the Sumerians called Ararat. It seems that the proponents of the Black Sea Flood hypothesis have found a real historical prototype for these legends. A great discovery. Is this really the case? No, on many points. First, this flood occurred roughly in the 6th millennium BCE, whereas all the texts depicting the flood, referring to the oldest ones, date back to the 4th millennium. A more significant objection is that during excavations of cities in Mesopotamia, layers of sedimentary rocks are found that were, undoubtedly, deposited by flooding. Thus, the floods that could have been the real prototypes for the flood stories occurred in the historical period. 
It is also worth remembering that legends of a great flood exist among nearly all peoples of the earth. There are such legends in India, China, and Central America. Finally, even Australian Aborigines, who are believed to have settled their continent about 50,000 years ago, have them. It is unlikely that they sent a messenger to find out what water invasion problems their Black Sea kin were facing. So, where did this universal mythological motif come from? Did such a flood exist that affected literally all of humanity? There is a hypothesis on this matter. The last glacial period affected almost the entire globe. And even if there was no glaciation on the land surface, all the mountains were covered with massive glaciers, which began to melt rapidly around 12,000 years ago. We set ourselves the task of comparing paleogeographic data with the texts of the Bible, Avesta, Rigveda, and other such sacred books. It turned out that they align and confirm each other. Thus, the data from natural sciences and the data from these, as they say, as if they were myths. It turns out that human memory reaches back quite far, 12,000 to 16,000 years, and it was preserved. This knowledge was preserved until it could be documented in writing. At that point, I proposed a hypothesis in which I did not use the term global flood as it seemed too abrupt, but rather era of extreme floodings. These floodings in total covered an area of 10 million square kilometers across northern Eurasia and had parallels in the Americas. Thus, the interim scientific conclusion is as follows. The Black Sea flood, regardless of the speed at which it occurred, was a late part of a genuine, almost global flood that covered the Earth at the end of the last glacial period. However, this does not conclude the unresolved mysteries of the Black Sea. Chapter 5. The Poisonous Sea The Black Sea is very deep, with a maximum depth of over 2,200 meters. It is a relic of a very ancient geological fault. The Black Sea began to form approximately 125 to 100 million years ago, initially as a shelf basin. Then, around 180 million years ago, it suddenly deepened to depths of two kilometers. The formation of the Black Sea is linked to the movement of the Turkish microcontinent, which drifted about 200 kilometers away from Europe, creating a zone of extension. In this zone of extension, a deep water basin was formed. At depths below 150 meters, the Black Sea is practically dead. The entire water column is saturated with hydrogen sulfide, H2S, the gas that gives rotten eggs their unmistakable smell. In this sense, it is a truly unique, albeit dangerous, body of water because below 150 to 200 meters, it completely lacks oxygen. The Black Sea is the most unique and famous case. This is due to it being relatively small and very deep. There is even a scientific term for it, euxinization, hydrogen sulfide contamination. Euxine, the Greek name for the Black Sea, has become an international scientific term. And once again, scientific debates arise. This time, they concern how the hydrogen sulfide contamination occurred. There's a theory suggesting that it was a consequence of that catastrophic flooding of the Black Sea Basin through the Bosporus Strait, which might have occurred around 7,600 years ago. After all, vast areas that were rapidly submerged were teeming with a vast number of living organisms. These organisms perished and began to decompose just as swiftly. So where does the hydrogen sulfide come from? What happened next after the seawater flooded in? Well, according to the hypothesis proposed by Ryan and Pittman, American biologists from Columbia University who wrote the book Noah's Flood, The Event That Changed History, here's what they suggest. 
When all this salty water finally poured into the basin, which was formerly fresh water, it is clear that everything living on the bottom, everything in the water column, those creatures that lived there I mentioned, like the beluga sturgeons, for instance, which could be up to nine meters long and weigh two tons, or the man-eating catfish that were six meters long and swam there. These were fearsome fish, worse than sharks. All of this suddenly perished. But when considering the numbers, the decomposition of organic life on the shelf and upper water layers, no matter how abundant, is unlikely enough to contaminate hundreds of thousands of cubic kilometers of sea depths with hydrogen sulfide. Thus, while the flood might have contributed to this process, its foundation was likely different. The thing is, seas of this kind, like the Black Sea and even the seas that were there before it, have always been similar. They were also poorly connected to the world ocean and contained deep basins. At times, or perhaps even constantly, there was hydrogen sulfide contamination in these seas. This would cause events when hydrogen sulfide reached the surface, resulting in die-offs. For instance, in the rock formations of the Mycop series, which represent a significantly earlier sea, we find layers that are simply packed with fish. These were such die-offs that led to massive fish mortalities. Due to the fact that many rivers flow into the Black Sea and the water does not have enough time to evaporate from its relatively small surface area, the upper layers of the water resemble something akin to a brackish lake about 150 meters deep. It is in these waters that we swim when we vacation at the resort. These waters are well oxygenated and support all kinds of marine life, including fish, dolphins, jellyfish, and plankton, essentially all the marine life we are accustomed to. This lake-like body of water slowly flows towards the shallow Bosporus Strait. However, it flows over a stationary core of deep water, which almost does not move and into which oxygen does not penetrate. Over the course of tens of millions of years, all the dead organic matter has been accumulating in the depths of this anoxic core. In the zone where oxygen is present. Microbes oxidize organic matter just as we do. But what about the zones where there is no oxygen? Well, it turns out that seawater contains another oxidizer, sulfate, one of the most important components of seawater. If we take sulfate and sugar, that reaction won't proceed but microbes can facilitate it under anaerobic conditions. Of course, it's not as efficient a reaction as sugar with oxygen. As D'Artagnan said, sand is a poor substitute for oats, and it is indeed very difficult for them. So life there is somewhat bleak. Using sulfate, they oxidize organic matter, and naturally, the sulfate is reduced to hydrogen sulfide. However, the concentrations of hydrogen sulfide in the Black Sea are not high. Maximum levels are close to 10 millimoles per liter. That's far from hydrogen sulfide saturation. Still, it dissolves well in water, so if we bring this water to the surface, it won't boil or release toxic gas. It will just smell. But our noses are structured such that they are very sensitive to hydrogen sulfide, much more so than any other instrument. Due to the human nose's sensitivity to hydrogen sulfide, if its layer were to rise to the surface, the Black Sea resorts would cease to exist. No one would want to improve their health amid the pervasive sharp smell of rotten eggs. Fortunately, about 150 meters of pleasant, lively, not very salty, and oxygen-rich water separates us from the hydrogen sulfide. However, there is a precedent. According to some witnesses of the Yalta earthquake in 1927, the sea burned with fire at night and an unbearable stench of rot emanated from the water. This means that when tectonic activity shook up this stratified cocktail, bubbles of hydrogen sulfide began to rise. But hydrogen sulfide almost does not burn. So what was burning in the Black Sea on the night of September 11th to 12th, 1927? This has been determined. 
the Black Sea constantly releases methane from the seabed, the same gas that burns on our kitchen stoves. There's a map showing the distribution of methane gas emissions in the Black Sea. Part of this methane enters the atmosphere and contributes to the global greenhouse effect. Normally, this is not ecologically dangerous, but there are cases when this methane is very hazardous. Specifically, in 1927, during the Crimean earthquake in the area of Totenkut and several other regions of the Black Sea, the sea itself was burning. It burned as a torch up to 500 meters high. All of these events are documented. Incidentally, while we were researching the coast of Georgia, we found a very peculiar phenomenon in Ochumchire called a methane seep and published this work in the reports of the Academy of Sciences. Afterward, the Georgians approached us and said that in this place, before earthquakes, the sea burns, and they have considered it for millennia as a signal from the so-called Ochumchire god. Thus, such occurrences exist. And so, there you have it. We have made estimates that a large influx of methane into the water can actually lead to the loss of buoyancy in ships. For example, the Bermuda Triangle is thought to experience methane releases. We calculated that if there are 30 liters of methane per cubic meter, the buoyancy of ships decreases. Methane is released from the seabed, where it also exists in a bound form known as gas hydrate, resembling a jelly-like substance. Now, let's imagine, into the hydrogen sulfide poisoned water, toxic methane is also being released. Can we even imagine any form of life in such a place? Thus, we approach the most astonishing mystery of the Black Sea. In this doubly lethal benthic environment, formations similar to corals actually thrive. Research, including that conducted by our department, has shown that in areas of methane seepage on the seabed at depths affected by hydrogen sulfide contaminations, so-called methantrophic carbonate structures form. They grow like corals, up to four meters high. These structures are based on the life of archaea, that build these structures, and the reactor in which they perform chemosynthesis is the structure itself. That is, in seas where there are methane seeps but no hydrogen sulfide, these structures do not exist. Both hydrogen sulfide and methane must be present simultaneously for these archaea to live. We hope that viewers no longer have doubts that we chose the right title for this film. The simplest and most understandable Black Sea has indeed turned out to be the most mysterious sea on our planet.